So my talk is high-end Unicode in Perl 6. How can we leverage the powerful Unicode capabilities in Perl 6 to make our work easier? So when our programming language has high-end Unicode support, if you will, Unicode becomes our friend instead of our enemy. And this tutorial will hopefully help teach you some new things about Unicode and some of the problems you can solve when you have a really good Unicode support. And one of the big uh, talking points of this is that you, programmers often complain how hard Unicode is. And it is a big standard. It has many different facets. Um, but the key point is that if you support all of Unicode, you automatically get access to a ton of things. So why is Unicode so complicated? Human language is pretty complex. So let's run through Unicode 1.1. Already all these scripts have been added year after year. And there's a lot of them. So it didn't really matter if you saw all of them. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the Unicode Foundation was originally founded to solve the problem of many different character encodings that were completely incompatible. They all tried to fit everything into 200 into um, eight bits. And obviously that wasn't gonna work for very long since you already saw how many different languages and different scripts there were. So that's what it what that's what its original goal was and it's um, kind of developed a little more than that. Um, and now its current goal is to encode the world's languages and the ways people communicate through text. And uh, as I said before, instead of having to support all those different scripts, you may not know all those languages, um, but if you support Unicode and you support um, the different standards that it has, you don't actually have to understand all those languages and all those scripts, and you can be sure that things will work properly. Um, so it's developed into much more than a standard which assigns uh, code points to named characters. Now it's also got into um, defining like collation algorithms, defining case changes, um, adding new characters. Originally, it just took characters from what had already existed and it has become the de facto standard and now it is unavoidable if you will to not use it so um re let's go through some reasons that characters are included in unicode so as i said before they were originally added because other uh, encodings added them and a lot of the weird things like the superscript 2 that was in previous encodings um and Unicode did not actually add that intentionally, but we have it today and people exploit that as we do in Perl 6. <laughs> uh, uh, so it was designed to losslessly convert from previous encodings and to be able to convert back. So there are these two conflicting things in Unicode where um, there's a great many things where they try and achieve being able to go both ways, to decompose and to compose characters. Um, and so as that was what they had originally designed Unicode to do. Um, and if a script is in use by people around the world, it's a viable candidate for being included in Unicode. And even if it's not in use by people in the world, if it's a historical text, then it may be added to Unicode as well. And we also get variations of Unicode characters that are meant to help transcribe historical documents. So we might get a certain um, strange ligature or a certain um, variation of a character, which may not make sense to us, but um, historical people who read these texts want to be able to transcribe it in a neutral way, how the character was actually encoded, well, encoded, written <laughs> on the historical document. So these are some of the reasons why we have what we have today. Um, so these are my personal goals for Unicode support in Perl 6. And that user should not need to know more than the basics of Unicode to be able to work with the text and to be able to 
harness um, all the different things Unicode has to offer. Um, the programming language should make working with Unicode a pleasure instead of a burden. And the often said Perl 6 saying, torture the implementers for the sake of the users is very true, as I have uh, spent many hours <laughs> <laughs> working toward this, but um, it's very fulfilling. So thank you. <laughs> um, so let's go through some term definitions. Um, since this was meant to be for um, even beginners uh, with Unicode, even if you don't really know much at all, and I was trying to make it also useful for people who have had a lot of knowledge about Unicode as well. I want it to be accessible to everyone. So this, let's go through character. This is thrown around a lot. What is a character? Um, is it just um, a byte? Is it more than that? So Unicode has some definitions. These are the four they give. Um, the smallest component of a written language, what a normal person might call a character. Um, the visual representation, it's also a synonym for an abstract character, which is one block, if you will, one um, unit. Um, and it's a basic unit of encoding for the encoded character system originally, if you're referring to each code point is a, is a character. So it has, it's very confusing. There's many different um, kind of flexible. Anything can be a character almost. So let's get past that here with this simplistic, confusing view. Um, let's talk about graphemes. Uh, and it's a minimally distinctive unit of writing. So in English, things are simple. An A, a B, a D, that's the grapheme. If you have an A with an accent, that's grapheme. That's an A with an accent, right? And so number two, I think, is the most important. And out of all the things you have seen so far, what a user thinks of as a character. Um, because our job as programmers is to take what the computer does and turn it into how people think and how people work with computers. So this is very important. And two is very similar to what Unicode defines as a grapheme cluster, which represents a horizontally segmentable unit of text um, which can have multiple code points in them. And Unicode really starts to blur the boundaries of what is a character, um, is a character two, three, four. And over the years, it's continually started to make it so that character boundaries don't matter. Um, they're arbitrary. And uh, they're arbitrary to the user. They see a character on the screen. That's what they see. And um, Unicode has given us lots of different tools to take advantage of that, or uh, at least deal with uh, what humanity has created as far as language. Um, so uh, in Perl 6, graphene clusters, that is how we count characters or count units of a string. Um, so what the user sees as a character and what Unicode defines as a graphene cluster is um, a character. So if you do dot cars, cares, or whatever in Perl 6, you get the number of graphemes. So let's base character. This is another thing um, similar uh, when I'm talking about graphemes. The base character is like an A, just a plain A. And base characters, you can attach accents, you can attach um, stuff to it. So the two main types of characters in Unicode are base characters um, and non-combining uh, mark characters. I mean, there's other ones, but as far as human language is concerned, those are the main ones. Um, and then you have control characters, which kind of act like just blocks of stuff. So, okay, so this is a very important thing that Unicode defines for us, canonical equivalence. So, you can have a, uh, does anyone know the name of the character with the C? The, someone must know. Sidia. Sidia, yes. So the Sidia, it can have, there's a single code point that encodes the Sidia, and there's also a C plus the accent mark. And you can encode it both ways. Uh, one is uh, one code point and one is two. And Unicode tells us 
that we can find out that these two forms are equivalent. And that's very important for comparing strings and ordering of combining marks. So we have these base characters, and um, I don't know if you've seen Zalgo text with text with just a whole bunch of random gibberish on top of it. Okay, so that really works the our normalizer hard because it has to combine, reorder all of these marks um, in the correct order. And there is a proper order for the marks to go. Um, so we can tell that two, uh, that they're different because you may have one uh, mark that is further away. So if it's first, it may be here. If it's second, it may be here. Um, but Unicode tells us which are equivalent forms and which aren't. Um, so in some cases, you may reverse it and uh, like the left one and the right is the same, but for a different mark, the same accent mark, um, if you have the accent come last, it may be uh, mean the accent goes in a different location. And so it's important to be able to figure this out because that's what we do. We try and make sense of all these user, what people want, which is all these words, and what computers want. They don't, they don't know anything about this. So Unicode has been very smart in how they allow us to programmatically figure this stuff out. Because otherwise it would just be a total headache. And I mean, it still may be a headache, but if we have our language already do it for us, then the headache doesn't need to be our own. So, um, so uh, Hangul, which is used in Korean, uh, those are composed of two or three glyphs. And all, unlike uh, other languages, most languages don't have every single character has to be composed. But in Korean, um, there is, it's similar to syllables, where you kind of add the syllables together, and you add one to the other, and it makes words and sounds. Um, so Unicode tells us um, how to make sure one is the same as the other and to um, compose it into actual characters instead of just sets of three or two, um, which is not very useful to us. And singleton equivalents, this is probably more boring. The one on the left is the same as the one on the right. And what is the difference? Um, is there any difference? There is sometimes. Uh, I think it might not be the Omega, but there is another one. The Angstrom, there's two different forms that look the same. Four? Four? Even better. <laughs> okay, so... Let me see. Uh, okay, so what Perl 6 puts into text is called the canonical form, which sounds nice, right? We want, we want the canonical form to get rid of all other stuff. Just Let's just deal with the proper form. So that's how Perl 6 stores strings. Um, and so NFD is the decomposed form. So if you look there, the, you can decompose it, and it has an accent, and you compose it, it doesn't. It's a single character. And so Perl 6 makes it very easy for you to do this decomposition and uh, composition. And I'll get to later how that actually, um, other than just looking cool and being able to get the information out of the characters, we're actually able to use that to make working with Unicode easier for people who might not even want to have to deal with it, period. So, um, and if you don't know Perl 6, or it's, it's the characters into a sequence. Okay, so more, more, let's talk about more equivalences. So for you people who don't like uh, Unicode at all, compatibility equivalence is nice for you guys because look at all these weird characters. You've got a funny H, you've got another funny H. How are you going to figure out that the funny H is an actual H without, I mean, you just want an H. So compatibility equivalence is one of the equivalence forms. It's, it's one way, unlike the canonical and the decomposed forms. Those, it can go either way, but this is mostly just um, getting the boring, uh, boring form, I guess you could say. So there's the fancy H's, uh, different cursive forms of an Arabic letter. Um, a circled one, you can get out that it's uh, 
ASCII one using the combat compatibility equivalents, and then you have funny characters that are all wide and kind of silly looking. So um, squared characters, all kinds of odd things here. So more acronyms that look kind of scary, right? So uh, Unicode decided that C is already used for canonical, the normal form. So let's use a K for compatibility. So that just means compatibility decomposed and compatibility composed. So what we can do is we can take the, those funny looking H's there and get out just a normal H. And we can take the funny Arabic forms, all those different ones, and get out the standard one. Same with the fraction and the squared letters for the, I'm not sure why that was added, but there must have been some reason. Just, just trust them. <laughs> okay, so same with the race. Okay, so I guess I kind of went over some of the basics. Um, so something that may be interesting for people to know is that um, all code points in the Latin one set of characters, they're already in composed form. So if you have characters like that, it's already good to go, and that's one of the reasons that like an A with an accent is in composed form with the accent because it's part of Latin one. And so, as I said before, graphemes can consist of uh, more than one code point. So uh, one of the main ways we do this is Unicode has a property called graphing cluster break, and it helps us determine how to break up the characters and determine if two code points should be broken apart or if they're part of the same unit. Um, there's more complex rules for Korean characters, um, as it's actually an algorithm um, based on the code point values. It's somewhat interesting, though somewhat confusing. Um, so Perl 6 uses normalization form grapheme, which is just NFC form, a uh, canonical form. The only difference is that it stores the multiple code points in a grapheme as a single unit. So it just designates to us that when we're working with one of something, it's a grapheme. So it's either a user visible character and not something else. So <clears throat> okay, so there's uh, many different ways of entering Unicode code points in Perl 6. So you can do it by the decimal form, hexadecimal form, uh, by the name, and that is uh, recently, I made that case insensitive. Uh, let's see, and you can supply multiple characters by separating them with a comma, and let's say you wanna take, some, take it from a variable and uh, turn it into the code point, you can use parse names, since the slash C form is compiled, and it's, you'd have to use eval to use that. <coughs> Okay, so uh, recently, a uh, couple months ago, maybe maybe a little more, time flies pretty fast, um, I added in support for name aliases, and previously it was somewhat confusing um, what we supported, because we have LF, NL, CR, those are sort of common, um, at least some of them, common Perl um, aliases for like the lane feed character. Um, but it wasn't actually codified as a supporting the name aliases. And so there's multiple kinds of name aliases. And one of the important things about them is it makes sure it never conflicts with an actual Unicode name. And it works across all platforms. It's, uh, and it's much easier having someone else figure out um, these names and making sure they don't conflict than bike shedding them or something else like that. So uh, we now support all the name aliases, which include corrections. Um, there are, uh, since uh, the Unicode names have never changed since version 1.1, they made that one of the guaranteed stable properties. And so we can now access them by the corrected names. So I don't have it on the screen here, but in one of the characters, it's kind of a probably not very much used character, but they spelled bracket wrong. Um, <laughs> Uh, added KC, I think, and so now you can 
Now you can spell it properly. I mean, <laughs> but it, it, it's still useful to have these because um, you may not want to use the incorrect name may not make sense anymore. Um, so it's good we have Unicode to tell us what we should call them uh, because I don't want that job. <laughs> okay, so we have control characters as well. So uh, uh, for some reason, I'm not 100% sure why, but uh, Unicode doesn't like names for control characters, but they added the control characters' names back as aliases. Um, and the only thing that's different is bell, um, because it conflicts with the actual bell symbol, but everything else is the exact same as the Unicode one names, um, but that has been removed. And there's also, as well, alert. Um, the original character was called Bell. Now you can use alert or a variation of names that people may like to use, um, acronyms, things like that. So that makes um, entering text easier. It's nice not to type out carriage return, the whole thing. It's kind of silly. But we, I know we have backslash R. Um, so let's see. Mm. <coughs> Okay, so name sequences. So as I said before, uh, yes, that didn't render, right? This is on my laptop. Um, but so we now have name sequences. And as I said, Unicode is continually blurring the boundaries between code points and series of code points. And uh, you can now access series of code points like Latin capital S with vertical line below. That's actually multiple code points. Um, by a specific name, and uh, as well like flags and um, emojis, you can get all of those and write to your friends how cool Pearl, Pearl Six is. So, <laughs> um, but as well other than the emoji sequences, there's uh, lots of language specific ones. Uh, lots uh, like Thai, right? I think Thai, and some other languages. They have dozens of these uh, sequence, name sequences because their letters have um, two code points in them. And so they don't want to have to write out two whole, basically the names for two code points. It's much easier to type it out as the name that they know it as. So very, very interesting stuff. So there's more emoji type stuff. Um, hopefully some that showed up. So, uh, as a good example, even though that rendered as uh, one icon, or multiple, I guess, the family right there, uh, Pearl 6 detects it as a single character, uh, or grapheme, and so we can get it from the name, even though it's a se uh, sequence, and treat it as if it, um, what, it, what it looks like on the screen. Because you don't want to separate up the emoji. If you did, you would just get probably bark over the screen or so, something bad. So, yeah, so support to all of those, all the name sequences, name aliases, full support on that. So what problems does it solve? I went, talked about this uh, already, uh, but user visible characters, um, and there's so many different scripts and languages, and the Great thing is that when there are changes or updates or more scripts added, they're already adding to the to added to the existing standard. So even though it may be work to implement the changes, they might be very minor. Uh, most of the time, they're just updates to the property values. And so what you've already um, done before is going to still work because it may be an entirely new script. Let's say it has ten code points per uh, grepheme per character, but uh, Perl 6 will still treat it as what a user will see on their screen. So it's uh, very good to have your code um, work in the future with some other language or the latest emoji craze. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, here's a good picture of how uh, Devangari um, has two and how it combines there. And a uh, person would never write out one of these. If, they wouldn't write it out. It's only, it mostly means this. So if you were to do a string operations and you split it right there by accident, then the user would be very unhappy. Or if you cut off their password and let's see, 
he trunc truncated it and it ended up being something they couldn't type on their keyboard, that wouldn't be great at all. Um, so as I said before, you, let's say you only care about uh, the original ASCII. Why do I need NFD or NFC? So Perl 6 has some very uh, useful features like ignore mark, uh, regex adverb. So you have all these accented forms. Let's say you just want to match anything that has an A in it. So you can do that with the ignore mark form, the colon M, and you will be able to match any, uh, any character that has a base Uh, that has a base of that character. And uh, similarly, uh, the ignore case functionality, it supports case folding, which allows you to match ligatures like ST um, or possibly um, other things in other languages. Some languages have may have four forms of a letter and they want to match against, they don't want to have to type in a character class of four different things. Um, so ignore case uses case filtering, as I said, and under the hood ignore mark uses the NFD form, decomposes the characters, takes out what it needs, and allows you to do regex without, um, with only using simple ACI characters. So this is a big thing. Uh, people using Perl 6 may not, uh, this is probably something that needs to be um, written about more. Uh, UTF-8 clean 8-bit. So, as I said earlier, Perl 6 keeps all the text in canonical form. You read something from a file, by default, it just um, puts it into the standard form, so it may be slightly different than what it was originally encoded as. And so, we have clean 8-bit um, to preserve that, the, however the text was encoded. So, it could be, let's say it's corrupt, UTF-8. Um, let's say it's not normalized properly but you want to make sure you have a bit for bit um, of the original, in, uh, the original file, you can use UTF-8 clean 8-bit. And it's also what we use for file names because if we were to read a file name and normalize it, or let's say it's just a bag of bytes and it could be just be something random. You still want to be able to access it on the file system. And the operating system is only going to know the exact um, name that it, it told you it was. So, to do this, uh, you can use the ENC option on all the file opening commands, slurp commands, and when you read it, you also want to make sure to uh, write it as UTF-C8. Because if, um, so you take it in as uh, clean 8 and you have to put it out as clean 8. And you can work with the string like that. And um, so how clean 8 works is um, all the text that is already normalized form will be identical to if you had read it um, normalized. So if you were to read a already normalized file in clean 8 bit, the string that you get when you slurp it will be exactly the same. So you can do operations, you can add stuff to the string, and um, if you um, want to make sure that it doesn't change and you get exactly what's there, you need to use this. and. Uh, People don't often notice it at first, but sometimes it will be confusing to them how their the number of bytes changed and how Perl 6 is stealing their bytes. <laughs> and uh, we, we don't do that. Um, well, we should use this if you don't want your bytes stolen. So um, if you want to make sure it's in some form that's not a uh, standard form. So as I talked about before, case folding, our ignore case um, regex uses full skating to tell us uh, to work. So canonical equivalence tells us two forms are exactly equal. Case folding tells us if they're approximately equal with regards to case, um, even though they may have different casing or forms. So this is not reversible as usual, where if you take a capital letter let's say, and you lowercase everything, you're going to lose some data because everything's gonna be lowercase now. So it's never intended to be a two-way operation there. So here's some examples of things case folded. <clears throat> so you have some ligatures. Um, 
where there are only one code point on the left, all of those single code points. And if you fold case them, um, it basically um, explodes the ligature to be multiple uh, characters. And uh, similar to uh, the B or S, I'm done. It looks like a B. <laughs> okay, so yeah, it puts it in a form that will be easily compared. And so this was somewhat uh, hard for me to implement, but I hope that it helps people um, and allows them to match text that may be somehow different than what they might expect. Because as the line blurs between the number of code points and character representations, uh, there's likely going to be more of this. And so it seamlessly um, works, even though the it allows you to match against these, even though um, the length of the code points will expand on case folding. And that all works pretty much perfectly. <laughs> so let's see, yeah, the 273 code points uh, where fold case and lower case are different. And that will probably increase as time goes on. And so one thing I uh, have been working on recently, which I'm kind of excited about, is the Unicode collation algorithm. Um, as I've said a lot of times, how Let's pretend that code points don't exist and we just have user visible characters. Um, the user doesn't care about them and uh, a lower code point shouldn't necessarily sort before a higher code point. So uh, the collision algorithm kind of decouples that from each other and it allows you to sort with regards to what, how the user would see it as. So you can sort the AE digraph with A and E, so different even though the A and the E is one code point and the other one is two, it will still sort in the right order. And um, at least I think that is pretty cool. Um, but even though that may just be a nicety, other languages, it, it's even more important for them to get it in a non-random. Uh, seemingly, they may get it in a seemingly random order, and you, this will solve that issue. So we have a... Okay, so uh, we have the collation dynamic variable, which uh, we can control all the languages separately. So if you speak English, um, then you use the Latin script. And for the most case, Latin a script, the primary uh, level is alphabetic, secondary is diacritics, and tertiary is case. And so the collation dynamic variable in my implementation of the Unicode collation algorithm allows us to either reverse or completely disable any of those three levels. And so uh, it is planned for me to also implement uh, different languages and country variations as well. So I'm um, hoping that will give you a wide degree of ability to sort things how you want them to be sorted. So here's some example of uh, actual output that I got uh, yesterday from my algorithm. So you can see how the, the this kit uh, sorts with the ST, or oh, let me do this again. So yeah, you can see how when it's sorted with the dot sort and it goes by code point, it sorts all the accents at the end, it sorts the ST, ligature at the end, but when you use dot collate, um, it sorts everything in the proper order. Uh, the weird S is with the S, and then right after the SS is the, um, the sharp S character, and it all sorts in a very nice order. And so getting the ability to, uh, by the way, that output is not with that set, it's just default how it's set here. Um, the output is not from primary being reversed and secondary disabled. That's just an example. Um, so we have some other things that uh, make your life easier. The, you can get properties of any code point with uniprop or uniprops to get it from any string. Uh, unimatch, uh, let me just roll through it. This is a summary. Okay, so same case allows you to um, change the case. Um, not super interesting, but um, 
it allows you to change it to the same the case of the what is in the parentheses right there and the last character ends up repeating for the end of the word um, if it's caseless it does, has no effect if it's lowercase it lower cases the character that lines up with it so same mark is similar to that except it works for um, <clears throat> accents and uh, things like that uh, as well in, for other languages. Since I don't speak any other um, language other than English, I'm not sure how useful that is for other scripts since it, it could do weird things. Um, yeah, for things like underscore. Oh, uh -huh. um, but I'm sure they would know how their character is composed if they are trying to use this. Um, so Unimatch uh, checks if the code point has a certain property. So for example, if you use it with no argument, you can see if uh, it is Latin set for any of the properties um, or the, specifically the script value. If you just wanna capture One minute. Um, the script, so let me go a little faster here. So we have uh, full case, lowercase, title case, uppercase, lowercase, title case, and uh, so Uniprop and Uniprops are shown here. By default, it gives you the general category here. Um, then Uniprops is a, a string operator, whereas Uniprop is really basically integer or the first code point of the string and gets it for. So Uniprops can tell us you, the first one is a letter other and the second one is a, a mark. It uh, supports almost all Unicode properties, at least 80% of them that I've tested. Um, and name aliases work as well. You can use shortcuts. And uh, that is the end of the slides. So does anyone have any questions? Not anymore. Yeah. Can you ask it if it's an emoji, like emoji a thing that exists in Unicode. Can I say, is this character an emoji? They do define um, standard emoji. I mean, technically, you could do something else, um, but uh, they do have a list of all the emoji, and those is it are. Built in? Hmm? Is it built in to fell six? Uh, well, we don't break up the graphemes based on the list we have, but we do have the list where you can type the name of it. It'll get you the code points out. Um, so that makes it forward compatible when they add new emoji. In most cases, it will work with newer emoji because it follows the same rules of the layout of the characters. So we do support all of those. Any chance this gets back into 205? <laughs> um, that would be cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I've never messed with it before. Let's one of the things I was thinking is there's actually like a fourth, you know, there's three levels, and then there's like a fourth level of how, because if you want to sort by spaces, it by default has a value of zero. But you can oh, the that's property end of it. slightly different, but I'm also planning on doing that as well. I mean, yeah. it might not happen within the next couple months, but what you, they do allow you to set is, let's say you want to ignore spaces or quotation marks and just yeah. sort based on factual letters that have meaning. And let's say if it's a one with two parentheses around it, it's a single code point or whatever, it'll just do the number one and sort as that. Um, so even things that are a single code point and have things that may, you may want to ignore, it still works. So I think it's very interesting how Unicode covers, the code points don't really end up mattering once you end up implementing it. And, uh, yeah, that is planned. Cool. Any other questions? Okay, I guess I'm done. Thank you.